Now, the first 12 verses of Romans 14 are Paul's call for believers in a divided church to get along with each other. So on the one side in that church in Rome, you have the weak in faith. Jewish Christians who feel that as a matter of holiness, they must observe some of the prescriptions of the old Mosaic law, avoiding non-kosher meat, only eating vegetables, observing special religious days. On the other side, you have the strong in faith. You have largely Gentile Christians whose conscience is unburdened by worries over the Mosaic law. They more readily understand that Christ has fulfilled the law and that in him they are free to eat all kinds of food and to regard every day as the same. And that would have been fine if these believers had simply lived and let live. But sadly, the Jewish Christians on the one hand are judging those who don't share their scruples, and the Gentile believers on the other hand are despising and dismissing people who have such scruples. And it's beginning to turn what was a godly, faithful church into a a toxic, divided fellowship. And that's why Paul doesn't respond by saying, here's the correct answer. Instead, what he does is address both wings of that church. And he, he basically says, just stop it. These are secondary disputable matters. This isn't about gospel truth. These are secondary, doubtful, difficult issues. And whatever the rights and wrongs, God is the judge. You are to accept those who God has accepted in his son. And you are to remember that every believer is answerable to God, not to you. And as for you, why don't you just mind your own business and get on living for the Lord? Those are the basic principles. Now, in verse 13, we have what we would call a hinge verse in the chapter that summarizes all of that and then leads into a new section. So, We have the summary of what's gone before. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. And that is really addressed to the whole of this church community. But there was still a bit of a problem. You see, just because something is perhaps difficult to understand and is disputable, it doesn't mean that there's no such thing as right or wrong. You see, the weak in the faith were wrong. They didn't need to observe the requirements of the Mosaic law. And Paul himself says so in verse 14. So the strong in faith were theologically right. And what tends to happen when people know that they're right, especially when the great apostle Paul has just said they're right? Well, pride. People who smugly avoid responsibility for their own actions. And you can imagine how they might have spoken. They might have said, well, yes, you know, I know. I know we sort of look down on on the Jewish Christians. Point taken, I won't do that again. Yeah, yeah, I was sort of wrong. But they are the problem, aren't they? Because they've got the wrong position. They're theologically wrong. You agree with us, Paul, don't you? We understand the implications of our faith. And we're just living that out. So we're not really the problem. It's them Jewish Christians over there. They're the problem. You need to put them right, Paul. Tell them how they're wrong. And that is why Paul does the exact opposite. In the second half of chapter 14, he puts the ball firmly in the court of the strong in faith. Now, the bottom line of what he says in the rest of this chapter is, put your brother first. So even though you are theologically in the right even though you're perfectly entitled to live out your Christian freedom, put your brother first. It's not about putting him right, it's about putting him first. And I think this is important for every believer in our church community here, because you see, let's be honest, just for a moment, I know it's hard to do as a Christian, we all like to be right, don't we? We really do. And we can probably all think of areas in our lives where, by God's grace, we have indeed got it right, where we truly are living by faith. Praise God. But if we're not vigilant, that can lead to arrogance and to pride, can't it? It can lead to us harming 
our brothers and sisters. And God's word is clear. Where it comes to disputable secondary matters, regardless of whether we've got it right or not, we're not to judge, we're not to despise, and particularly, and this is what we're going to think about, we are never to abuse our freedom of faith. We're always to put other people, other Christians first. Now, how are we to do this? Well, Paul gives us two don'ts and one do. And we'll start off with the first don't. Don't stumble your brother. Paul says in verse 13, let us stop passing judgment on one another and instead make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. Now, there's an interesting play in words there. Make up your mind is probably in most other English translations, judge. So in other words, Paul is saying, look, rather than judging the performance of other Christians, perhaps you should start judging how not to trip them up. Because that's what a stumbling block is, isn't it? It's something that causes a person to stumble, to trip over. Now, how might we do that? Well, by the abuse of our own Christian freedom. Let's just uh, imagine this scenario. There is a, a fellowship meal in the church in Rome, and the whole of the community there, the whole of that church are gathered, perhaps in somebody's house, and meat is on the menu. But there are Jewish Christians present who are extremely uncomfortable with this because it goes against the conviction of their own conscience. So naturally they protest vigorously but the strong in faith who are happy to eat the meat dismiss their protests you're just being legalistic we're free in christ to do this you've got no right to forbid us in fact you should be joining us you need to understand your faith better and so under duress the weak in faith reluctantly eat the meat that is served them now Nothing outward happens. They're not struck dead with fire from heaven. It all seems fine. And yet something serious has happened inwardly. Look at what Paul says in verse 14. As one who is in the Lord Jesus, I am fully convinced that no food is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for him... It is unclean. So Paul, born and raised a Jew, once a Pharisee, he's clear, those old purity laws from the Mosaic law are gone. No food is intrinsically unclean in the gospel age. Christians are free to eat what was once forbidden. And yet, if a Christian sincerely believes that meat is unclean because their conscience tells them so, then for them it is unclean. And so the careless, thoughtless actions of the strong in faith have caused that person, by eating, to violate their God-given conscience. The arrogance of the strong in faith has caused a stumbling block which that person has tripped over. Now that still might not seem too serious to us. It's just a little stumble. I think too serious about that, but in the Bible, stumbling block tends to be a metaphor for a spiritual downfall, and it's very serious. And to get an idea, look at verse 15. If your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you're no longer eating in love. Do not by your eating destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Now, distressed isn't merely feeling a little bit annoyed or a little bit put out. This is about pain and anguish. This is the kind of grief a person experiences when they have lost a loved one. It's a bereavement of sorts. You see, when a Christian sins against their God-informed conscience, there's complete turmoil inwardly. Now, destroy, it's a very sobering word, isn't it? It's used deliberately, though, by Paul. And in case you think, well, he didn't really mean it, he uses it again in verse 20. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. And the implications of that word are frightening. 
because we're talking about things like something destroyed, ruined, decimated, you know, like a, a city that's had a nuclear bomb just dropped on it. Now, we have to remember, don't we, that Paul is writing to genuine believers. He repeatedly refers to your brother, which means a fellow family member, a blood-bought child of Christ, someone, verse 15, for whom Christ died. And nobody in that position can ever be destroyed in a final sense. We have to believe that. If you have been chosen before the world was made and you have been justified by an unchangingly faithful God, you are saved forever. And no true believer can ever fall beyond the reach of the good shepherd and just topple into hell. It can't happen. But a believer can make a mess of their Christian life. A Christian can dishonor the Lord who died for them. A Christian can become totally compromised and entangled by besetting sin and the joy and peace of the Lord which should be theirs can be replaced by fear and guilt and the effectiveness of their walk can be ruined and but for the grace of God that person would turn from their faith and into apostasy which does lead to ultimate destruction. Now in verse 23 Paul explains the theology behind this. The man who doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith. And everything that does not come from faith is sin. Now, I think we should all know by now, having gone through Romans, how central faith is in the life of a Christian. Do you remember how Paul spent the whole of Romans 14 explaining how Abraham wasn't justified by works, but by his faith? God's supernatural gift to the human heart. The faith to believe an invisible God and unseen promises. By faith, Abraham looked away from human sense, earthly wisdom that said, you know, why would you want to leave a nice metropolitan city and go into a land you've never been before and live in a tent? Why would you want to do that? By faith, Abraham did it. He looked away from human sense and earthly wisdom because, you see, true faith doesn't look within. It doesn't look to other people. Faith looks to God as all-sufficient. And that was Abraham. He believed by faith, and it was, the Bible says, credited to him as righteousness, accounted to him as righteousness. And to live in any other way than living by faith is idolatry because it is trusting someone else other than God. And Hebrews 11 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And therefore, our conduct as believers mustn't stem from a desire just to please others, or fear of others, or, or satisfying our own selfish whims. It must stem from our faith in God. And when a believer decides to do something outside of that saving faith, despite having serious reservations, and despite not being sure of whether the Lord would approve, and they repeatedly do so under pressure from others, they are not depending on God's sufficiency, are they? They are not living by faith. They are living by sight, as an unbeliever might. And that's as serious as it gets. And the way of sight is destruction. So in this case, for example, the Roman believer eats what he truly believes in his heart to be unclean. And therefore he is condemned as he eats, not because the meat is unclean, but because he believes it to be unclean, and yet he eats it anyway. Now the condemnation I don't think is eternal condemnation because of what we've already said. But it is both the condemnation of the conscience and I think it's the temporal judgment of God. And it causes great anguish in the heart. And here's what is really difficult. Paul is saying to the strong believer, you can be the instigator of all that. By the abuse of your Christian freedom, you can be guilty, in effect, of spiritual vandalism, of tripping over a believer, stumbling them away from faith. Now, that doesn't deny the truth, of course, that ultimately every individual believer is personally guilty 
responsible before the Lord. You don't have the power to destroy another person eternally. Only God has that power. And yet, the actions of a believer can be the catalyst to someone stumbling away from the faith and into sin. And that is awful. Now, it's one thing to understand your Christian freedom, but Christian freedom is never, ever meant just doing what you want. Because, you see, when you eat, Paul says, selfishly, because you're allowed to, you're no longer acting in love. You're abusing your freedom. You're putting your brother or sister in grave danger. Now, I appreciate that there probably isn't a, an exact modern parallel to this, but I, I gave it my best um, go. So let's imagine the following scenario. It's a shared lunch. Now, this is quite a common one because we have one every month. It's a shared lunch here at church, and you are aware of several people in the fellowship who are teetotal, not merely as a personal choice, but out of deep conviction. They believe that alcohol is wrong for the believer and they refrain from drinking and they have done their whole life. They are following their God-informed conscience on this. Now, you are someone and you have no problem with drinking alcohol. You don't get drunk. You just like a couple of glasses of wine with your meal. Fine. But what you decide to do is bring your own booze with you to the meal and drink it in full view of those you know are teetotal and you even try and persuade your teetotal brethren, come on, lay your hair down, it's fine. Have a small glass of wine. The Bible doesn't forbid it. Now, if you were to act in that way, you would not be acting in love, would you? And you would worse be in grave danger of stumbling your brother or sister and of causing them absolute decimation in their heart. And that is not right. You see, you and I have been saved into Christ's household. We've been saved into a family. That's what we are. We're a family of fellow blood-bought Christians. And love is to be at the center of that family. Love not just shown in sentiment or words. We can all do that. But in concrete sacrifice. In self-denial. In relinquishing your rights. If need be. Not parading them. Putting other believers first. Believers, plural, is the context of verse 20 where Paul again speaks of destruction, but in the context of the wider church fellowship. He says, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. And the work of God refers to the church community. A miracle of God's grace. And again, destroy doesn't mean Christians being damned to hell or a church being burned down, but it speaks about decimation, in this case, of the strength and unity of a church being destroyed. About the witness and effectiveness in the world of that church just being ruined. Notice the comparison with verse 19. There... Paul speaks of mutual edification, the building up of believers. And here, in verse 20, it's the opposite. It's destroy, which is about tearing down believers. And all for the sake of a plate of meat. That's the tragedy of it. But, you know, churches are often decimated by even more ridiculous things than that. Disputable matters. Now, there is a second implication here. And it is Paul's second don't. And what he says to us in verse 16 is don't dishonor the faith. Verse 16, do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. Now, initially, I suppose Paul could be speaking of the meat. The meat is good. Nothing wrong with the meat. But I think it has a deeper meaning than that. I think Paul is referring to the goodness of our Christian freedom. For you see... The strong in faith weren't wrong. The Christian living under grace does enjoy unparalleled freedom. They really do. Galatians 5.1 says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And free we truly are. The Jews weren't free. 
The Old Testament Jews were hemmed in by a law which regulated their national life but could never regulate their hearts. It could only make their guilt plain. And in fact, often it provoked them to sin more. It couldn't save. It could only condemn. And once upon a time, every single one of us here wasn't free, were we? Once upon a time, we were enslaved by our sins. We were sin addicts. And the only choice we had was whether to sin more. We couldn't break the addiction. We couldn't stop sinning. But because of the Lord Jesus Christ, every believer is free in him. We are justified people. I mean, what justification is, it's God's declaration that it's as if we never sinned and it's as if we'd only ever lived a righteous life. That is our eternal, settled status before God if we're a Christian. How? How can sinful people who still mess up be justified? Well, it's because by the gift of faith, we have been brought into intimate fellowship with Jesus. He is in us. We are in him. And in this union, we share, we participate in Christ's salvation work. His death, our death. His life, our life. His resurrection, our resurrection. And therefore, we're not under the power of sin anymore. It remains. It doesn't reign. We can say no to sin because we're in Christ. And nor are we under the authority of any external law or written code. We are under Christ's authority, the one who fulfilled the law perfectly. And Christ is a loving master. And there is freedom and there's rest under his lordship. That's the amazing truth of the gospel, of the book of Romans, that Christ has set us free from sin's power to be the people that we were created to be. Men and women and children of dignity, who have a real relationship with our creator. And that's wonderful. And yet, for all that, Paul says, when you parade your freedom selfishly and you put a fellow believer in danger, you're actually making something that is good, Christian freedom, into something that's bad. And that's an awful thing to do. Because when God says something is good, it's good. And when God says something is evil, it's evil. And it's wrong when we flip these things around. It's a sign of an evil age when such things are flipped around. Do you remember what Isaiah 5.20 says? Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Now, I think we'd all agree with that, wouldn't we? That's what's going on in our world. And yet, when we as Christians parade our freedoms... At the expense of a weak brother, we cause that brother to despise and revile our Christian freedom, something that is good. And we cause them to say and think that something so good, freedom in Christ, is somehow wrong. And that causes the gospel to be blasphemed and in the world at large. As an example, do you remember in 2 Samuel 12 where David was brought to book by the prophet Samuel for his great sin of adultery and murder. And Nathan says that David had made the enemies of the Lord show contempt. So David, by his sin, had dishonored the kingship. He dishonored his people. He dishonored his own witness. And worst of all, he dishonored the name of of God in the world. And so he caused people to say, well, Israel and God and God's things are just like the rest of us. They're evil, they're they're murky, they're corrupt. He had become a stumbling block to both the saved and the unsaved. And I think that's a warning to us. We do not live our Christian lives in isolation, do we? We're saved into a family. And how we live with our family members has an impact here and further afield. And if we live selfishly, if we parade our freedoms and we don't care about anybody else, we put them in danger, we stumble them, and we do damage to the cause of God's kingdom in this world. And unbelievers who look in will just see selfish people, divided people, and they'll think, well, that's what Christ stands for. And if that's what Christ stands for, I want nothing to do with it. 
That's what it means to call something good, bad. And that is why all things considered, Paul says in verse 21, it is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother to fall. And yes, yes, it is a restriction of your freedom. But that's love. That's how love operates. Love prefers the church to be united and individual believers to be growing and flourishing than selfishly flaunting its own individual freedom. Now, that's the negative case. Two don'ts. But we do have a positive case as well. And, uh, and it's this, that we are to have a sense of of godly perspective. Verses 17 and 18. This is what Paul talks about. Now, do you remember how the Pharisees of Jesus' day operated? In Matthew 23, and verse 23, Jesus has to rebuke them. And this is what he says. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, cumin, but you've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness, You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. It's quite a vivid language, isn't it? Basically, the Pharisees were so fixated with the minutia of the ceremonial law that they totally ignored what God really cared about. Justice, mercy, faithfulness. They were blind men without any sense of perspective. They couldn't see the wood from the trees. And ironically, these Gentile believers in the Roman church were guilty of the same thing, only in reverse. So they rightly understood that it was now lawful for them to eat anything, but their personal freedom to eat what they wanted had become more important than the spiritual well-being of their Christian brothers and sisters. So they had also lost sight of what is most important in the kingdom of God. Now, what is most important? Well, we know it's not trivialities like food and drink. They should never be decisive, and nor is it outward conformity to rule and right. Paul tells us what matters in verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. That's what matters in God's kingdom. Righteousness, peace, joy. Now that is a description of an outward reality. It is a description, I think, of what Christ's church should look like. Right living, upright people who deal with other Christians justly and in love, resulting in peace and harmony among believers. But I think it's more than a description of behaviour. Where do these behaviours, these qualities spring from? Well, Paul adds the phrase, doesn't he? In the Holy Spirit. Righteousness, peace and joy are the Spirit's gifts imparted through Christ's death and resurrection. Righteousness, God's saving righteousness, which transforms us and in which we are clothed through the Lord Jesus. Peace, the end of hostilities, vertical peace between us and God, thanks to Christ paying the price of our sins. Joy, a deep, otherworldly assurance in our hearts that Christ's salvation work really was once for all, that we are safe in him and a deep contentment in who he is. That is, in short, the gospel. And these are the gifts of the gospel kingdom, imparted to every believer and as spirit empowered Christians we are to be daily transformed by these things isn't that what 2 Corinthians 3 speaks of being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the spirit this is transformation of the heart the renewed heart it's the inner man and and it flows inwards and then outwards Believers who are truly gripped by these realities are believers who will live them out. They are believers who will understand that God's kingdom is not about gratifying their own sinful desires or parading their own freedom. Instead, they will understand this and, verse 19, make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. 
and in so doing, they will truly be serving Christ. A lot of people serve Christ in name only. You see, the fact that Paul has to urge these believers to make the effort to pursue these things suggests that they weren't making the effort. And perhaps often they, were, they thought they were serving in Christ's name, but they were serving their own appetites. And they were prioritizing trivialities like food and drink. But sadly, this is what happens when we lose our grip on the gospel. When our hearts are hardened, we cease to be in awe of what Christ has done. It becomes quite sort of just commonplace for us. It happens when we slowly but steadily stop praying and we stop reading God's word and we stop bothering attending church. And because the gospel hasn't got a grip on us, disputable matters fill the gospel shaped hole and we start to fixate on them. And it happens in churches where the gospel of Jesus isn't central. Other things fill the void. And suddenly churches fall out over worship music or end times theology. Or even, remarkably, the colour of the paint on the walls of the church hall. I kid you not. And that means that no matter how hard we work, no matter how many people attend our church, however successful we may be outwardly, If we're obsessed with trivialities at the expense of the gospel, because we've lost sight of the gospel, we're not serving Christ. We're not pleasing God. Our works are but works of straw. And in the end, our church community will not be a happy one. It will not enjoy the true kingdom blessings of righteousness and peace and joy. And so I think this is a call to us as individual believers and a church To have a sense of perspective and proportion. What's it all about? It's about Jesus Christ crucified. Christ did not give up his life as a ransom for many so that we could then live for ourselves and be at each other's throats. He saved us to change us, to transform our hearts so that we might look like him. So that we might be a community of his people a community of mutual love and sacrifice, a community that shines in a dark world full of selfish people. And, you know, when it is all about Christ, you aren't going to be bursting to put people right on secondary matters. Instead, verse 22, whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. And you will do. Now, I don't think Paul means... You can't have an opinion on disputable matters. Verse 14 makes that clear. Paul had a clear view on Christian freedom. And nor does it mean that you must never share your views on any subject, because I would never be able to preach, would I? There is a time and a place to talk about the Lord and to share your view. Paul means simply this. Don't endlessly trumpet your view. Don't be forever loudly telling people what you think with a view to try to impose your view on them, which is sadly common within church fellowships. Sometimes I think it arises out of insecurity. Believers who struggle to cope with the idea that other believers think and act differently to them, so they are forever wanting to raise things with you. But often I think the opposite is true. Often it comes from an over-realized security which we would call pride. Christians who feel so right in their own views that they must put other believers right on their theology. And whatever the reason is, it ultimately stems from a lack of godly perspective when Christ is not central. And it can be a serious stumbling block to other believers. And so what Paul is doing is Presenting a better way, the polite way of putting it it is the way of gracious, loving restraint. The less polite way of putting it is just stop talking so much. Uh, You might think that's a bit ironic coming from me. I've been talking quite a while. I'm nearly finished. (laughs) What Paul is saying is keep it between yourself and the Lord. Be convinced in your own mind. Search the scriptures. Seek clarity in your mind. Talk to the Lord about it, yes, but don't keep trumpeting it before others. Yes, by keeping it to yourself, you'll lose the satisfaction of putting other people right. And you might even have to forfeit your rights 
for the sake of your weaker brother, but you won't lose out. Because you see, the one with weak faith who ends up being pressurized into conforming to the views of others and violating their own conscience, they are a miserable, conflicted person. Their hearts are disaster zones. They have no peace. They have no joy. They only have guilt and fear. But there's a special blessing. Did you notice it? A special blessing for the strong of faith who understand their freedom and yet do not abuse it or parade it because they care about others. Listen to verse 22. Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. When you quietly, privately enjoy your Christian freedom without any qualm of conscience, you will know the blessing of peace and assurance in your heart, not the guilt of condemnation. And that is a happy place. That is a blessed place. Do you know that the most legalistic Christians tend to be those who feel most guilty within and they project their guilt onto other people. But people who are secure in Christ without being proud, those who are content in the Lord and at peace in him, they won't browbeat others. In fact, they'll even relinquish their rights for others because they are blessed within and they know priceless treasure within because they truly understand that Christ is the greatest treasure. Knowing him, there's no greater thing. And this is what Paul holds out to us, doesn't he? Not the approval of men, but the blessing of God's approval and enjoying freedom in him. And we have God's approval in the Lord Jesus Christ when we live lives of humble and dependent faith in his finished work of salvation and we submit to his authority. There's no greater joy or peace than that. Paul says, doesn't he, back in verse 7, none of us lives to himself alone. None of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful if everyone in our hall and everyone in our village and everyone in our country and in our world could say that? Wouldn't it be wonderful if each of us here really is fully trusting by faith in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ? If we all truly understand that every sin of ours has been forgiven in Christ and that we're headed for glory and resurrection if Christ really is central in our lives. Because you see, if all those things are true, if we really are believing those things, then we can lay aside the secondary. We truly can live united lives of righteousness and joy and peace in the Holy Spirit. Now that's humanly speaking impossible, but it is wonderfully possible when we are all trusting in the same Jesus by faith alone, through grace alone. Or perhaps it's the other way around. I never remember. But may the Lord help us to be that, those people, to be a church of people who love each other, who love Christ, and who keep him central, and who enjoy these wonderful new gospel kingdom realities of peace, joy, and righteousness. Amen.